Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Rathman. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at Dry Creek Vineyard. I'm joined by our winemaker Tim Bell today. We are really looking forward to this tasting today. It's been one that I, as soon as we started doing virtual tastings, I said we have to do this. And for your fun little fact, this is the only time of the year that we can do this three bottle series of the terroir series because we don't typically have all three available at the tasting room at the same time. So we were very specific. It had to be this month. So I'm really glad that it worked out and I'm really happy that you all could join us today. So usual housekeeping, we're gonna keep everybody muted for the time being. We have the chat functionality at the bottom. So please send me your chat questions and we'll get them answered. Um, and one other thing, if you need the live transcript button, that is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So if that's something that's gonna help you be able to catch all of Tim's wonderful information, please don't hesitate to use that. Oh good, Eugenia and Lee were able to join us. Great, well, we will go ahead and get started then with no further ado, I will introduce our winemaker, Tim. Well, welcome everyone. Um, good, good to see you once again. I always look forward to these tastings. And, um, you know, it was, it was a little extra um, degree of difficulty today. The uh, power went out at the winery. So um, I made a mad dash home. That's where I'm, I'm uh, coming to you from right now. And Sarah's at her house and here we are. We're all in each other's house, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've got a, a great lineup here. These are some of, you know, well, I guess I probably say this all the time, but some of my favorite wines. Um, just really love this terroir series. But um, yeah, starting out, um, I guess I will, like I often like to do, sort of talk about where we are in the, briefly in the, in the season of growing and, and in the winery, um, what we're doing. And so right now around us in all the vineyards, we've got uh, rapid shoot growth, shoot growth happening and we're in set. So that means the grapes are actually flowering and we're gonna, we're, you know, hopefully nature will provide us with a good crop. And, um, you know, we, we, had, we had some, uh, a little bit unusual weather um, today, like a lot of wind. And when I was driving home, I could see uh, some rain clouds out there to the east, um, not, not expected. So that was kind of a surprise, um, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a little nervous around here, quite frankly, when it's windy and dry <laughs> and there's storm clouds um, from past experience, but um, we're going to think good thoughts about that. Um, you know, at the winery right now, um, we are um, in the middle of bottling. So um, we've been, um, you know, just, it's been kind of a crazy year <laughs> too, in terms of the supply chain is kind of all messed up. So we can't necessarily get all of our glass at once or all of our capsules at once. So we're, you know, we'll bottle, we're right now, we're bottling a few days of, of uh, 2020 Fumé Blanc, and then we're gonna switch to a little more of Heritage Zen because we were delayed on getting more glass for that. So we're, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a funky uh, parade here. And then, and we've, we've gotten a few of the single vineyard Zinfandels in the bottle as well. So um, we just kind of do what we can and keep chugging along. And, um, you know, the good news is all those wines um, have been tasting great. I really love, um, all of all of what we're putting in the bottle this year, and I'm excited when you guys get to get to try it on, on especially some of those single vineyards Zinfandels that um, haven't been released yet. Um, so today, um, you know, we we've got three Meritage wines. Well, actually, two. One of them is a Cabernet. It's not technically a Meritage, but it, it, our Terroir series. Um, you know, we emphasize these Bordeaux varieties, and. Um, I want to, you know, a lot of you probably know that we have a long history with um, the term meritage, which is, you know, a, a term that we use for Bordeaux style blends. And um, it can be for whites, it can be for reds. You know, in more recent years, we've started a white meritage blend called the Marinus. And, um, but, but in this Terroir series, we've got a couple of really wonderful meritage blends, the, the Alluvial Gap and the uh, Benchland as well. And so, that term meritage was uh, coined back in the 80s. Um, our founder, David Stair, was part of the group that created that term when they wanted a term that they could use on wines that um, referred to a Bordeaux style blend. Because at that point in time, the only options left to them for labeling was to just call it um, red wine or red table wine and um, didn't usually have a high quality connotation. So they wanted to create this term that, that um, 
uh, you know, brought memories of, of Bordeaux and, and, and really was used for higher end wines like, like we have tonight and um, held this contest and um, got a lot of entries and a lot of publicity that they didn't expect. And in the end, this term meritage was coined. It's the combination of merit um, and being, meaning the, you know, the, the great, you know, some of your best wine of, of each vintage and then heritage um, from Bordeaux region of France where we've, we've inherited these, these great varieties, you know, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Malbec, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. And uh, we use all those in different ways and in, in different wines and different blends. So um, anyhow, we, we, we were the first winery to actually use that term meritage back in 1985. And this is a, an example of uh, our, our label from then. Um, it looks a little blue here, but it's, I think in real life, um, was it, was it more purple than this, uh, Sarah? <laughs> no, this one was actually a pretty blue label for us. <laughs> yeah, this one's blue, okay. We, we have some purple labels of that era too that it kind of, I call like purple rain because it, I don't know, it's, they're just very purple, very pastel. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that was, that's a cool, um, I, for me, I think a cool connection to our history that um, we were the, the original winery to come out with, with this label. And there's been many since, and it's become a term that's that's a meritage has spread all around the world. Um, initially, it was just in the United States, and now it's it's spread internationally. So other countries use it as well. And so um, this this terroir series is is relatively new for us, and you know we we wanted to um, start to offer different Bordeaux style wines to the wine club to all of you folks, and. Um, I had been sort of had percolating in my mind this idea of, of um, doing these different blends or um, wines from different regions of the valley. So, because you know, after after working here for a number of years, I realized that we have very different soils and different climates in different areas of our valley. You know, Dry Creek Valley is about um, you know almost 16 miles long. It's it's kind of a the proper valley proper is kind of a long narrow valley. And um, we open up at the southern end to the Russian River Valley, a little cooler region. And ultimately that sort of leads out to the San Francisco Bay where we get some nice cool maritime air that comes in uh, typically in the evening. And um, um, yeah, well, here's a, here's a good uh, view of that. So you, you can see to our south, we kind of heading down towards San Francisco, um, it, the land kind of flattens out. Like, like on this, this map right here, where you see a lot of that dark green, those are mountains and, and, and along the coast. And, and then there's some mountains along our east side as well. And where it kind of gets more, more uh, brown, um, that's lower elevation land. And basically that provides a nice channel for some cool air to come in at night. And so we, we get some, uh, well, this is a great shot. You know, you get this little blanket of fog and, and cool air. And, um, you know, I've been at, at one of our vineyards like Bogensen in the past where, you know, it's kind of a higher elevation, you know, a little over a thousand feet. And you can see down below this, this blanket of, of fog. And sometimes you kind of just see it sort of rolling into the hills, uh, really kind of a, a cool view. And um, it's very important to influencing our climate. So, um, you know, the, the southern end of the valley is cooler. The, the, the northern end is, is warmer. Um, and then we've, we've got kind of, you know, different areas. So um, the western side of the valley has some very fairly steep slopes, um, typically very iron rich soils, um, rocky terrain. We've got the eastern side. Um, and here's, here's a, an example of, of what you, you know, in a very general sense, what you find in the soils in these different areas. Um, you know, the eastern side of the, of the valley is um, we, we more what we call a bench land. So it's, it's uh, there are some mountains and hills between us and, and um, like Alexander Valley, but really um, there's, there's a lot of sort of low lying hills and, and elevated land that's, that's higher than the valley floor. Um, and so it's sort of in, somewhere intermediate between those, those really rocky Western slopes and the more rich valley floor soil, um, which is that bottom uh, section of the slide is where it says sedimentary soils. And then, um, you know, kind of its own area also um, in my mind is um, the, where we call the wine we call alluvial gap. And it's, it's uh, kind of the lit, around where the Lytton Springs area is. I mean, that's kind of the local name for it. Um, and that is closer um, to the east on closer to Alexander Valley. So it's a little warmer and, um, and a little bit lower elevation than, than um, some of these other areas as well, but still very 
nice hills and, and rocky soil that's, that's well drained, but a very different soil profile there as well. And so, you know, we, we, had, we had this idea for the different wines. And so we, we you know, played with this idea of, of a terroir um, series and it's been really fun for us. And, and we, we've gotten some great attention and I just love the, the labels and packaging for this series so well too. I mean, we've got this really cool map on the front label that will show you the different vineyards and exactly where the, each wine came from. And then some very great uh, technical information on the back presented in a very clever, unique way that's, that's pretty different from some of our other labels as well. Um, so a really distinctive package. And then you've got the, uh, you know, the 10 pound bottle to tell you it's really good, right? <laughs> So um, and I think that's probably a, a enough enough babbling for now. Um, um, although I, I I did see one one um, I'm going to go off off script here a little bit here. I saw one one question come through about um, grapes flowering and and asking if there's a smell, and um, the answer is I, I think so. <laughs> it's not really intense. Like it's not like if you stick your nose in a rose and you get that you know or a you know you're like I've got um, jasmine right by my front door. And I don't even have to get close to it. I just walk up the sidewalk and I, you know, there's aroma everywhere. But because um, it's blooming right now. But um, grape flowers um, are, don't have a lot of scent. And, and in fact, they, they don't really have, um, it's kind of an upside down flower. The petals are actually upside down and they pop off. And then you just have the reproductive parts left. <laughs> and that, that's what makes grapes. Um, but um, I have had some people say they can kind of pick up a little bit of scent sometimes when it's when you really have a field fully in bloom and you're kind of out there in it. You know, you probably have to be right there in it, and and maybe you get a little bit of scent, but um, typically not a lot. So okay, how about some wine? Um, I've got a glass here. Um, so our order today tonight we're going to start with the alluvial gap. Um, this is a 2017 vintage, and um, there's the label right there. So um, you can see in the center of the label, in fact, you know, this is a great map. So the, the winery is there and then kind of south and east of us is, is a couple of little blobs that show us um, the vineyards where the wine, the wine came from. And that, that uh, top portion there that says 22% on it in very fine print is um, Puma Springs. This is a, a vineyard owned by our friends, uh, Tony Crabb and Barbara Grisecci, and they grow um, four different Bordeaux varieties there. Um, in this particular blend, we used um, uh, two of those. So we used um, some Cabernet from their vineyard and also the Cab Franc in this blend is exclusively from their vineyard. And so it's a really wonderful vineyard, very close to our own Endeavor vineyard, um, which, is, which is that bigger piece down below that on, on the label. And uh, they, they've, um, they, they not only are a sustainable vineyard like, like we are, but also um, a biodynamic vineyard. And um, they really um, do a great job there. Um, we actually have the same people managing their vineyard and our vineyard as well. Um, so Matt Vogensen is our, our vineyard guy that takes the lead and they do a really nice job there. Um, and so, so Cabernet and, and Cab Franc from Puma Springs. And then from our Endeavor Vineyard, um, a good bit of the Cabernet, kind of the majority of the Cabernet. And then also um, a nice bit of Petit Verdot. So um, it's actually 32% um, Petit Verdot, which is, seems pretty hefty, but this is really beautiful balanced Petit Verdot. Um, it has really nice pure fruit and um, you know, a good tannin structure. It's not overpowering. So um, I don't know if you have it there, give it a taste. And I'm, I'm gonna give this a little sniff and a taste too. So, you know, I, I get some really nice aromas of cedar and kind of, you know, rich black raspberry and, and chocolate. Get that, that, that also in the flavor. Um, the tannins are still a, a little bit, you know, they're present there, they're a little bit drying. So it, it, this wine is definitely not at, um, uh, it, it has more life ahead. You know, it's, it's, it's not um, at the end of its life by any means. So it should lay down pretty nicely for a while. And um, yeah, beautiful richness. The 2017 vintage too, I, I think you've, if you've been in any of these tastings recently, you've heard me talk about that because we've been tasting some of those wines and along with some 2018s and, and newer wines. But um, you know, we had a heat spell at the end of August and into the beginning of September. So three, uh, sorry, five days. Um, there was, it was 
really pretty darn hot. And so it, it really accelerated the vintage. We had to pick a lot of fruit quickly so we didn't get too high of sugars. Um, but we did get these really concentrated wines, really nice, rich, full wines. Um, they're just really mouth filling. So um, really beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, with these wines, we, we're usually in the range of, you know, maybe 35 to 40% new oak. It's a little bit higher than some of our, our other um, red blends, definitely higher than our Zinfandel. You know, Bordeaux with a, these bigger, richer, fatter kind of wines can just handle more new oak. And, um, and part of the benefit of that new oak is not just imparting some flavor, some toastiness or other, you know, nice spices or vanilla and, and other nice compounds, but um, it, it also kind of helps um, stabilize the color and you, you just, you just get a, a little bit um, more freshness out of the wine ultimately. And we, we use um, some of our, you know, particularly some of our, our French cooperages that we really like with Bordeaux varieties. Um, you know, when it comes to, to Zinfandel, which is, is um, you know, kind of a different animal, we use an, a, a good combination of um, American oak, Fr French oak and European oak. But with, with some of these high-end Bordeaux blends, we tend to do more French and, and some European as well. But, but um, you know, the, the French in particular seem to have, have it down as a, getting a good match for barrel and the Bordeaux reds. So uh, I've, I've been talking a lot about the wine, but um, any, any questions coming up here? Oh, people are just listening, it seems like. I don't have a lot of questions yet. So there was a question of um, Eugenia asked about our, uh, our who's the brain behind the labels. And so basically we've been working with a designer for decades. And so he knows us in and out. Um, he knows everything about us. You know, we love him. It's, it's really a great process to work with him. Um, and then of course, you know, Kim, our president is the one who leads that effort. Um, and so she really has, you know, a very strong sense of, of what she wants and wants to portray with the labels. So it's a really fun collaboration, you know, between between those two, and and of course, you know, the rest of us get to have our opinions and and share what we think as well. So it's it's a really fun team effort to come up with these kinds of concepts. Yeah, like I said, I, I love this label and 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 presents really um, a lot of a lot of information in a in a very clever kind of way. I think. Um, and so you know. I, I talked about the 2017 vintage too, producing concentrated wines, but but also this area um, that you know that we call alluvial gap area does um, have, have a little higher, hotter temperatures, and so it, that by itself um, you know produces a little more concentration in the fruit as well. And um, in our Endeavor vineyard, there's you know we we usually do two or three picks of the Cabernet. It's a it's a big Cabernet block that's going all all of these the the hills, and so there's some areas that um, are um, you know more rocky and the vines are a little more stressed so those you know and they, they produce less fruit so those those grapes and the, that area is picked first and then um, and then we'll go, go to some of the other areas that are have a little higher ha higher crop and, and let that sit for a while wait till it's ripe and then we pick that later so it's it's a very um, labor intensive um, uh, process for me every year to kind of go through and mark the rows row by row where we want to pick and where we don't um, so I, I spend quite a bit of time, probably more time in this Endeavor vineyard than any other vineyard because it's such a big vineyard, but also, um, you know, and complex and, and really good quality. So we really want to carefully, you know, get the, the right piece of the vineyard picked at the right time. So Tim, we did get kind of a follow-up question on the Petit Verdot about how, you know, that's higher than traditionally in Bordeaux reds. And I know that you like to use a lot of Petit Bordeaux in our endeavor as well. You know, is there something that you really like about that varietal that adds to these blends? Yeah, so, you know, the, just so in, in case people don't know, um, we've got, you know, the different, five different varieties um, all have unique personalities. So the Cabernet Franc tends to be one of the lightest in color and body. Um, and, you know, has some nice sort of, you know, red fruits and, and sometimes people say it smells like violets. Um, the uh, um, Merlot is kind of next in line. It's, it's a little bit richer than Cabernet Franc, but definitely lighter and lower in tannin, like that drying sensation that you get in the mouth from, from young red wines. So Merlot is, is, is sort of the next in line in terms of body and richness. Um, and then, um, you know, Malbec, um, 
is can be very intense in color, like um, Petit Verdot or sometimes even Cabernet, but usually doesn't have as much tannin. So it's a, it's a kind of a little fatter, a softer wine. Um, really great for filling out the mid palate. And then, um, and, and I'm getting to Petit Verdot. So Cabernet is, is, would, would be sort of next in line, I think, too, where it's, it's got that combination of, of richness and bigger tannins and a lot of complexity in its flavors. And then finally, Petit Verdot um, is, is, again, one of the, the darkest colored um, grape varieties um, you can make. And, it's, and, and in the Bordeaux spectrum, it's one of the darkest colored ones, typically. And it, what I like about it is it has really nice, fresh fruit flavors. It doesn't have um, as much of the herbaceousness that you might get with Merlot, um, Cab Franc, or um, Cabernet Sauvignon. So it can, can balance that out. Um, and it, it, it also has really good structure, you know, good tannin structure. And um, so it, I really like it um, because it just, it, it makes a nice, big, rich um, blend. And that's, you know, what with Endeavor and, and to some degree with this wine, we're really looking for it. And, you know, even though this wine is 32% Petit Bordeaux, it, it's not, it's not massive. You know, I think it's, it's still very balanced and has some elegance. And so, you know, it just really works. And, it, you know, each vintage is going to be different. Um, one vintage, you know, that amount Petit Bordeaux may not work. But, um, you know, it, it, I just thought for this vintage that really, um, that really worked. And what would you say for aging? I know that we're going to get that question all the way along with, with all three of these wines. So what would you think about for aging? And, you know, we've done this wines for a couple of years now. When is kind of the optimal time to drink them? How long can we hang on to them? What do you think? So um, I think any of these wines, any of these three are going to do really well, probably easily up to the, the eight year mark, maybe even 10, you know, and, and I always, you know, put the disclaimer that's, that's if you have good storage conditions, you know, temperature around, you know, maybe 55 at the low end to 60, maybe even 62 degrees, but nice, even temperature doesn't fluctuate. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, somewhere in that, that eight to 10 mark easily and, and, you know, beyond that, it kind of, for me, becomes a matter of taste. If you like to still have some of that fresh, youthful fruit, um, then um, you might um, want to not go beyond 10 years or even maybe eight years is your max. But if you like some of that softening and, and effect that you get from the, in the tannins and, you know, a little bit more mature flavors, then, you know, 12, 13, 14 years might, might work for these. And as we go through these, um, if I'll taste them and I'll, I'll give you my opinion if, if I think it should be any different from that. But that's kind of for me, the sort of the general window for I think all of these wines. Great. Well, should we go on to the Benchland Meritage? That sounds good. <clears throat> so the, these next two, we're moving into the 2018 vintage. And um, this was a, a little bit of cooler vintage. So, um, and, and it gave us a, a longer growing season. So, um, it, the, the advantage of that is you get to you know kind of take your time more and sort of cherry pick different blocks and di of vineyards and so forth. Um, you know the downside is it makes harvest last longer, right? Um, and and by the end you're really ready for it to be over. But um, the, this Benchland um, is a, is another just really beautiful wine. It's got some really beautiful purple color, and I'm, I'm going to give it a little taste here, and then we'll talk about the blend and how we put this together. <clears throat> So yeah, nice fruits, a little bit of smokiness from, from the, the oak treatment. Yeah, and this wine is just, for me, very plush. Um, and that's, that's the Malbec. Um, this blend is 60% Cabernet Sauvignon and 22% uh, Cabernet Franc and 18% Malbec. And um, the, you know, the, that, like I talked about, the Malbec just really fills out the mid palate and makes it a really plush, kind of almost velvety style of wine. Really nice um, chocolate and cocoa in there too, and, and a little bit of earthiness. And um, boy, this is just, this is just makes me want to sit down and have dinner right now and, and start drinking this wine with it. Um, so the, the label here, you, you can see um, three different vineyard sources for, for this vintage. So, so down at the bottom, that, that bigger uh, section um, is Saini. Um, this is, it may have been, I think, the first vintage that we got some Cabernet from Saini here in Dry Creek Valley. So the Sainis are a, a, a long time growing family and they've, 
um, you know, ever since I've been at Dry Creek, we've been getting some really great Sauvignon Blanc from them. That, that often is a, a key component of our Dry Creek Valley Sauvignon Blanc, and, and some of it goes to the Fume as well. But um, you know, we've, we've added some other grape varieties from them in recent years. And, and this Cabernet, we, we started a few years ago. And in particular, they've got some on this, this east, this, this bench land is, is, like I said, the elevated bench soils. So it's, it's um, higher elevation than the valley floor, less fertile soils. And, and this, this vineyard actually kind of slopes up to some hills. So <laughs> there's my dog. Um, <laughs> at, the, uh, at the eastern side of the, the vineyard, um, it's uh, less fertile soil. So the vines are a little, don't put out as much fruit. And I, I, I could see that when we first started getting this vineyard. So we, we pick that section first. And, and that's part of what we used in this blend. It's just gives us um, a little extra concentration in the fruit. So smaller berries, less liquid. Um, you know, your ratio of skin to, to juice is, is um, a little more intense and we get more extraction that way. Um, and then um, the, the middle section um, that has a, a good bit of this blend from it is, is right here near the winery. It's our DCV6 vineyard. And that's where we grow the Cabernet Franc and the Malbec. Um, and um, you always probably, if you've heard me say it once, you'll hear me say it forever. You know, some of the best Cabernet Franc I've ever worked with in my career um, made me believe in the variety again, and some really beautiful Malbec too, some of the best Malbec I've ever had as well. And so it's a good excuse to sort of pump up the, the amount of that in this blend and show it off a little more, and, and it really works. Um, you know, the Cabernet Franc is a, is a clone from the Loire Valley known for its intensity of color, and it is, um, you know, it does rival some sort of lighter Cabernets um, in terms of intensity, it's, it's really beautiful. And, and then, like I said, the Malbec, dark color, um, nice plush feel. And then, and then the, the, the north end of the, the, the um, map on the label is the Walcott Vineyard. And this is a, also a vineyard that we've been buying fruit from for many years, old friends of the winery, um, and they grow a beautiful Cabernet there. Um, there's some nice rolling hills um, at the, you know, the front of the, the property that come right down to um, Dry Creek Road. There's some terraces that kind of wrap around the one side of the hill. Um, sometimes we pick that separately. And, and that front piece is, is usually picked on its own. And then in the back, of, the, of there's a house at the property. In the back of the house, there's more vineyard land. And it's a little smaller section that typically is one of the first pieces we pick and um, has this really nice divided canopy. Actually, the, the whole vineyard is a really nice divided canopy um, in the way they've trained it. And um, that, that back piece um, has some little extra intensity and is often a kind of an extra special um, sort of ingredient that we can use in these blends. Any, uh, any questions or anything yeah. come up around this? That's what I was just going to say. So, well, you are getting some food pairing questions. So I know you were just talking about dinner, which sounds delicious to me. So I don't know if you have any thoughts for this. And then, you know, we can also go back to the, the alluvial gap of what you would have with each of those. Yeah, so um, it might seem a little um, unexpected, but I we just had some really good pork chops last night, um, you know, seared in, in a pan. And um, I think this actually would be really nice with that. Um, or, or really, um, like I like to grill pork chops too, and you, you do a, you know, a little bit of a marinade with some, some garlic and herbs and maybe even a little lemon juice, but, um, you know, get a little of that smokiness from, the, from um, you know, using like some hardwood to, to grill on. Um, so yeah, and, and that or some really nice grilled chicken, I think for sure. Um, it certainly could go with red meat, this, this um, bench land, but um, I think because of its, it's a little bit sort of plusher, softer texture, I'm, I'm thinking of something maybe not quite, um, you know, totally like steak necessarily. Um, you know, if we backed up to the alluvial gap, I, I think this would go, you know, that would go really well with, with different kinds of red meats, you know, lamb, uh, beef. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think that would be my choice. And I guess we'll talk about the, uh, the Iron Slopes cab when we get to that one too. But I have a good idea what I think I would eat with that one. Exactly. Um, so we got a question about the corks and the labeling on the corks. So I don't know if you wanna bring that up for a moment. I know I don't have a picture at the ready, unfortunately, for this time. So this, this is a, um, you know, if, if, our, if our president Kim was here, she would love you for asking because this was a pet project. So um, this cork has a lot of sustainability information on it. 
Um, and we actually patented the design on this cork. I think it was the first winery's patent, I believe. Um, but it basically tells you when the, the trees in Portugal, the bark was harvested for these corks, um, tells you how old those trees are on average, <clears throat> and gives you some information about the uh, benefits of cork forests. And um, it's, it's all presented in a pretty clever graphic design and, and, and a really cool way. And just, just reminds us that, that cork is a sustainable product. So, um, you know, it is the bark of, of the cork oak and um, they, they strip the bark off and punch out the corks and, you know, create, create this wonderful closure that um, we haven't really come up with anything too much better than that. We've, we've got some rivals, but, but cork is still really good. And, um, and it's, you know, the cork bark grows back. So in, you know, nine, 10 years, they can harvest the tree again. And so these, these trees live for a long time. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's definitely um, a long-term business. You know, if you're planting new cork oaks, it's, you know, it's gonna be years down the road before you, you see any um, product out of it. So you have to kind of keep going through that process, I suppose, is, you know, if you've got trees that, that die off, then plant new ones, but just kind of an ongoing cycle. Um, so I don't know if there was more specific question about that with the cork, but um, yeah, that's our, that's our sustainable cork information. And it's, it's, um, it's gotten us a lot of attention. People really like that. Great. Well, we did get a question about um, someone has the 16 Eastern Bench Meritage. So is there, and they were kind of wondering what the, the vineyards were for that one, if it was a different blend. And I guess I would just follow that up with of how, how do you pick which vineyards get to go into these blends from year to year? Is it the same or are you looking for different things? Yeah, so the, you know, the percentages of varieties and even the vineyard can potentially be different every year. Um, you know, for the first wine we tasted, Alluvial Gap, um, we're, we're consistently using the two vineyards involved, Puma Springs and Endeavor, but the you know, the percentages and the varieties are different. Like we may use, we didn't use in, in 2017, we didn't use Merlot, but you know, we may use Merlot um, in other um, uh, vintages of that wine because we do get some Merlot um, from Puma Springs and it's beautiful, it's, it's really nice Merlot. But you know, it's just sort of trial and error in, in some ways, but, but really the, the whole process is I, I, I take notes, um, extensive notes on every variety, every vineyard, um, and every barrel treatment. So if, you know, a given Merlot or Cabernet has two different types of new oak or three different types of new oak, I taste all those separate. And I, I, I just know what the characteristics are. And then knowing what we want to get out of a particular wine means that's, that's how I choose those barrels. So it's very much a barrel by barrel selection. You know, we're only making a few hundred cases of these wines. So it's, it's, a, it's a very individualized barrel selection for all of these wines. Um, and um, sorry, tell me the question again. I sort of lost the thread. Um, I know. Sorry, I was. I, I just kept asking questions and didn't give you a chance to answer them. Um, so more specifically, the the difference in the vintages for the oh, yeah, vineyards yeah. that you're using for the for 20, this particular wine. So 2016 Benchland. So yeah. I don't have the information in front of me, but from my memory, I'm pretty sure for that one that we used Cabernet from Walcott, and I believe also from Forkini which is another vineyard It's very close to Walcott um, and, and makes get some really nice Cabernet from there as well. Um, we did, I don't believe, we weren't getting Cabernet from Syene yet. So that wasn't a part of that blend. And then um, I know that we use the DCV6 uh, Malbec and Cabernet Franc as well. Great, and then, so what do you think about aging for this one? Yeah, you know, this one, I, I think I would stick probably more you know, to that eight year mark at max, you know, maybe 10, it might surprise us, but, but it, it doesn't have quite the tannic structure that the alluvial gap does, or that I, I think we're going to find in the Iron Slopes Cabernet as well. Perfect. Well, if you have any other thoughts on that one, we can hear that. Otherwise we can move to the Iron Slopes. Yeah, no, let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive into the Iron Slopes. So this is also um, 2018 vintage. And um, I'm gonna give this a taste as well. You taste it, tell me what you think. <clears throat> you know, right off the bat for me, I, it's a little more, more classic Cabernet slash Bordeaux 
style um, aroma, a lot of cedar, which I, I associate sometimes with, with Bordeaux reds. Um, yeah, really nice sort of black cherry, um, you know, maybe even a sort of little, little bit of a boysenberry pie filling. Um, so give it a taste. Yeah, so a lot of those flavors follow through. I think that the black cherry really is prominent. Um, it's actually, you know, got a little bit of more plushness than I than I than I normally expect. Quite honestly, from the Iron Slopes, and I, I like that. Um, this may have been the first vintage. I'm not sure, uh, but that we used a little bit of Malbec in this. So um, it's primarily Cabernet. So it's 97% Cabernet, but 3% Malbec. Um, and so the uh, the um, the Cabernet is from a few different sources. So um, you know, one of our mainstays of this wine has been um, Matt Vogensen's vineyard, which if you look at this label, it's near the top of the label where it says Bradford Mountain and those little, um, you know, sort of blobs there above that, that's Matt's vineyard. It's kind of in two sections. It's a high elevation vineyard, very, very rocky, extreme kind of growing conditions. And you, you drive up the hill and you kind of reach a little bit of a, a plateau sort of. It's, it's got some hills and a lot of different blocks, all, all these different slopes, very varied aspect. And then this photograph, is the higher elevation still. So it's that second blob you saw in there higher up. And um, you go up and you kind of come out and, and you're, you're above the tree line almost. And, and um, you're, you're, where this photo was taken, you're kind of standing on the top of a hill. And then there's, there's some, yeah, rolling hills. And that, that first photograph had a very steep slope. It didn't look that steep in the, in the photograph, but if you go hike that, it's almost like, you know, heart attack hill. It's, it's pretty steep. And, um, and, and it, there's also another block of Cabernet there that's kind of on the, the top of this hill. It, it's a little flatter, it's not terribly sloped, but very rocky. In fact, they call that block rocks <laughs> because I think when they were, they were um, you know, doing some digging and, and to plant and put you know, the trellises in and so forth, um, they probably were pulling a lot of rocks out of the ground. Um, and then um, the, uh, the other Cabernet um, vineyards are, um, so, so a little bit further down um, below Vogensen, um, there's one that says 19% and that's um, JR Vineyard. This is um, a, a really nice um, vineyard um, on West Dry Creek Road, um, kind of some, some gentle slopes there and produces really beautiful Cabernet. Um, it's it's uh, owned by some of our, our friends that, that run um, Juice Beauty products. Um, and then um, at the very bottom of the map, is uh, an, a vineyard that's kind of way out there in the boonies. Um, it's called Mercer Golden. It's owned by, by Bruce Golden and Michelle Mercer. And um, again, really nice Cabernet. It, it's, it's one of the last Cabernets we ever harvest because it's a cooler area. It's, it's closer, closer to the coast um, and out there in the mountains. And so, um, um, but some, some really nice, um, rich and elegant Cabernet. And then at the very top of that, that map, you see up there um, near Lake Sonoma, that's where um, the Malbec came from. And that vineyard is owned by our old friend, Harry Merlot. Some of you that are longtime members of the wine club may have heard us talk about that vineyard before. Just a really stunning vineyard out there in, in high elevation in the mountains, very red, rich iron soil, which is again, very typical of these, these Western hills um, and, and really rocky soil. And so we've, we've started getting some Malbec from, from Harry's vineyard and um, are lucky to have that as, as a, a blender with, with this wine. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's only 3%, but I, I got to think that that's kind of helped add a little bit of the, the fatness and, and the velvetiness that I get in this wine. Um, I guess I'm going to give it one more taste and, and, and think about, about ageability. And also what you're going to eat with it. That's what everybody seems really interested mm -hmm. in. Yeah. So, um, Ageability, you know, I, I think this is, you know, 10, 12 years probably nicely. And I think it'll take on a very nice sort of Bordeaux, um, Bordeaux-esque quality, if I may, may say that so. Um, what I would eat with it. I think, you know, um, I might go with like some really nice um, roast beef actually, or even a, a somewhat rare steak, maybe even one that you, you sear in a, in a cast iron pan on, on the stove. And, and not maybe a lot of, you know, maybe some salt and pepper and, you know, maybe a little bit of some, some dried herbs on there or something, but not a lot, you know, just um, a really good cut of meat and, um, 
and, and this wine. And that sounds really good to me. Great, we have a quiet group today. I think a lot of people are, might be eating dinner. I'm looking around at the cameras that are turned on. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions about this wine. You know, one thing that I that I noticed is that over the years watching this blend, you have reached out. I think we had maybe three vineyards the first year we did it, or maybe even two. And so now we're up to five different vineyards on this one. So how has that process of kind of crafting this wine and finding those vineyards gone for you as this wine has evolved? Yeah, well, it's it it certainly has been an ongoing process. Um, we've been buying, you know, getting the Cabernet from Bogenson Ranch for many years, and so we always we always knew that that was really good. But it was just in more recent years that we we were able to find the fruit from the, the JR Vineyard, and um, that was that was um, you know really nice uh, addition to the portfolio. So I I expect that to often be a, a part of this wine for the for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, the Mercer Golden Vineyard, we've actually been getting that for quite a while too. Um, because it is a little cooler site, I don't think it's going to make it every year. It's going to depend on the vintage. Some years it's going to work and sometimes it might just be a little too herbaceous. So I sort of expect to see that one sort of wander in and out. And, and actually, as I, as I say that, I realize um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the future holds for that vineyard because unfortunately, um, it suffered some pretty significant damage from the fire last year. And so it's it's been removed and they're going to be replanting. So um, we'll see where that goes. Um, and then with with um, the Malbec from from Harry Merlot, um, you know, that's that's a recent addition. And we really were wanting another Bordeaux red variety um, to, to go with with this Cabernet and provide a little more complexity and little, you know, just a little different texture and, and um, different choices um, in a flavor profile. And so um, we're still, you know, we're still just in the first, you know, 2018, I think was our first vintage of that Malbec. So we're still kind of learning that vineyard and we're actually um, this year switching to a different block. Um, and, and I, you know, this, this Malbec from 2018, you know, worked well, but I think we're going to, this other block that we're going to be sourcing is going to be even better. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's an evolving process. Um, you know, if, if we find some other vineyard, see, see on, on the Western slopes, we typically find just a lot of Cabernet and not a whole lot else necessarily. But um, if we find another vineyard that works, um, um, you know, we might add that to the portfolio. And, and, and actually I, I realize as I say that, um, Friday, tomorrow morning, I'm going to look at another Western slopes vineyard that we have never purchased from before. Um, and they've got some Cabernet and Merlot. And so we're gonna check it out. And I, I don't know if that'll go anywhere, but um, it looks like it could be a promising um, addition to the, the group. So Eugenia asked a great question of how do you find a vineyard? <laughs> yeah, so it's 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 networking. It's it's really that. Um, if you're you're looking for certain varieties and certain fruit and maybe from a certain area, you just kind of start putting out the word. So um, you know, for example, our vineyards are farmed by um, Bevel Vineyard Management. It's a vineyard management company, and so they farm our vineyards and other vineyards. So they have their their hands in you know a lot of different pies, so to speak. They 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 have a lot of different potential sources, um, <clears throat> and so um, that's that's you know one source that we might find. And and in fact, they're farming this vineyard. I'm going to go look at tomorrow. But the way we found that vineyard was actually um, um, Kim, our our owner, had been talking to the owner of it and they said, you know, I've got this vineyard and I've, I've got some fruit available. And so we kind of made the connection that way. And so, you know, we're just kind of always have our, our, our um, eyes open and our ears perked up to, if we see something that looks like it might be promising and might fit in for, for one of the wines in our, our, in our, you know, all these different wines we're making, um, you know, or who knows, it could be a new wine. Um, you know, we'll try a little something out and, and then, Take it from there and see if we want to continue the relationship and and what 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 is it what can we do with that fruit you know we just we just want to find the best fruit possible and keep keep getting better and, and evolving well and since you brought up the fires last year were there any other of the western slopes vineyards that were impacted was one of the questions um you no know, um you know there there actually was fire on the property of Harry Merlot's vineyard, but it didn't make it into the vineyard itself. It was just some of the brush, you know, at the highest elevation. Um, so yeah, no, not, not, not any vineyard, no vineyard was impacted. 
um, from the, in the sense that, that vines were damaged. Um, everybody was impacted in the sense that there was smoke in the air, right? <laughs> yes, I had my biannual sleepover with my parents and everyone else in my family. Um, Faye would turn the bottle around and is looking at the back label and asking, what does the TA on the back label refer to? Does it refer to total or total acid, total acidity? Yeah, so it, it's TA technically is is stands for titratable acidity, but it's it's really basically total acid. Um, um, yeah, that, that's what it is. And then Janet asked a question and I'm very curious of your response. What does it take to start a new wine or a new blend? besides your marketing person asking you to make it. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you add that or did, did but... <laughs> No, I added that caveat of besides, besides me saying, hey, Tim, what do you think about? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, marketing is a factor, right? Um, but no, it's, it's, it's um, I, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but basically like with these terroir wines, we, we had a niche that we wanted to fill. Um, we wanted to make something, some wines that were different from anything else we were doing, um, but we wanted to have them have a reason for being there. You know, it, it, it wasn't like, we just wanna make up a, you know, Joe's red blend and, you know, throw some things together. You know, so coming up with this terroir concept to me, I thought really made sense that um, we're focusing on sub areas of the valley and getting to kind of showcase the personality of, of different areas of our valley. And um, yeah, so it, it's, it's things like that, you know, we, you know, it might be that we have, um, you know, a really great vineyard that we can stand on its own. And, and um, if there's a, a, a need for that wine um, to be a single vineyard wine, then we can start producing it. Um, so I know, it, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of not giving you a really great straight answer, but it, it's, it's always different, you know, it's, it's um, <clears throat> but basically, you know, we source from a lot of different vineyards. And so, although they, a lot of them go into the blends, you always kind of keep in the back of your mind, like if we needed to do, ever do something, you know, this vineyard, you know, might be really good on its own, or, you know, maybe these two vineyards together instead of, you know, 10 different vineyards in a blend. And so, um, you know, that's just something as a winemaker, you're always kind of looking at, at uh, what possibilities might be ahead in the future. So Janet was wondering if we would ever do this with the whites. Um, so do, oh, like, like terroir blends with the whites? I white? guess so, yeah, I think that's what she's asking. Um, honestly, haven't really thought about that. Um, there's most of the whites in the valley tend to be on the lower elevations in the, in the valley floor, so, we, you know, from a terroir standpoint, we don't have as much variety there. Um, you, you could occasionally find some, maybe some, you know, like some Sauvignon Blanc in, in hills here or there, but it's pretty rare. So um, I don't know <laughs> the answer. I, off the top of my head, I would say it's, it's less likely. Great. So we had one more question of how are you feeling about the 2019 vintage in light of the fires? Yeah, so in, in, if, you, if, the, if you're wondering about any impact on, on the wines themselves from 2019, the answer is, is pretty easy with that one. We had um, pretty much all of our fruit picked that year um, before the fires happened. So um, not really any impact there. I'm, I'm trying to remember, you know, we have enough fires, <laughs> the different fire vintages are starting to run together. But I'm, I'm pretty sure in 2019, we only had two vineyards that were picked like on the first day of the fires. And so very little time, because one of the important factors in smoke impact is the time of exposure, right? And the, the other is the, you know, sort of the freshness of, of smoke and that's related to proximity. <clears throat> and none of the fires in 2019 were like right near any of those vineyards and they didn't have a lot of time to um, impact the vineyards. And so, you know, the fruit was brought in and, you know, I've, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time tasting the 2019 Bordeaux's right now because we're preparing to do blending for those. And um, they're, there's, they're, you know, they're not smoky. There's not anything weird about them. So I feel very, very confident about those wines. And, and 2019, like 2018, was a little bit cooler vintage. 
Um, you know, the wines may be, you know, particularly for Zinfandels, may be a little, you know, sort of elegant and, and, and be a little bit light on their feet. But, um, you know, I think like tasting these 2018s from a cooler vintage, um, there's no lack of, of richness or flavor there. These are um, some really beautiful wines. So I expect the same thing from the 2019s. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. It seems like that's the questions that we have for the night. Um, we have our upcoming tastings to make sure you have on your calendar. We have our June 24th tasting with Tim. Uh, that will be going over our new releases. So DCV3 Sauvignon Blanc, our Summer's Ranch Zinfandel, and our Merlot. So we'll get a little deep dive into those. And then we're going to take a little break in the middle of summer uh, in July and then come back on August 5th. And that's going to be for the Old Vines in Vertical Tasting. So if you were able to participate in that last year, you know how much fun that one was. And so this is 2017, 18, and 19. So that will be a great one. And those are very limited as far as the wines being available. So that's something that if you do want to join in and you want to have those wines, now is the time to get the wines. Yes, I'm looking at you. So thank you again so much for joining us. We just love being able to connect with you guys this way. Thanks so much for sticking with us. We hope you all are staying safe and healthy and able to get back out there as much as you can. We can't wait till we see you here in person at the winery. And Tim, do you have any final thoughts to lead us out? Yeah, just uh, like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see a lot of old friends um, here and um, I don't mean your age. I mean, you've been friends for a long time with us, right? And uh, <laughs> it, it really warms my heart. Um, and I do look forward to seeing you in person because we really miss you. So um, thank you for being here. This is, is great fun. And, and I, love, I love talking about our wines. Absolutely. Well, we love listening to it. And we love you guys asking us the questions. It's so fun to be able to see you guys. So thank you again. We will see you soon. The next virtual tasting, if not sooner, somehow, some way. All right, good night, everybody. Take care.